Coming up on Arts District, painting and music intertwine in a rare showing of the works of Monet. Costume, stage building, and math behind the scenes at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. A Thornton artist helps prevent pollution with a message of hope. Plus, music from Straygrass on the Western Slope and more. Kate Perdoni. And I'm Michael Gadlow. Welcome back to Arts District from Rocky Mountain PBS. A picture is worth a thousand words. What about music? Like at the Denver Art Museum, where music plays a huge part in the creation of exhibits. Viewers learn how to listen to paintings in more ways than one. That's right. The museum recently collaborated with the Denver Philharmonic Orchestra, developing a French Impressionistic concert to complement a very special exhibit. And if you haven't guessed, it's Claude Monet. The Truth of Nature exhibit features over 120 of Monet's paintings. Many which have never been to America. Producer Rob Barnett takes us there. You know, the arts at the time, uh, sort of, they had cross-pollination. At the same time with the Impressionist movement were happening, there were Impressionistic tendency in poetry and so in music. So artists at the time uh, were not in a vacuum. And the music, because it, it responds to the same um, sort of stylistic tendency, uh, we do believe that it helps our visitors um, immerse more in, in a time and go back in time. My name is Angelica Daniel. I am chief curator and curator of European art before 1900 at the Denver Art Museum. As we often do in exhibition, we actually include music throughout our galleries, and we did the same this time with our Claude Monet exhibition. We listen to music of the time and try to find the right rhythm for certain paintings. You might have something that is very slow and, and sort of with a, a slower cadence, which doesn't go well with the scenes of Bordighera, which are an explosion of colors and an explosion of brilliance. So we do look at the paintings and we do listen to the music. And like any visitors really try to look, would, would, does this help me when I look at this painting? My name is Lawrence Golan and I'm a symphony orchestra conductor and I'm the music director of the Denver Philharmonic Orchestra. We have this wonderful partnership with the Denver Art Museum. Uh, the partnership revolves around the Monet exhibit. Obviously they'll be having many wonderful paintings by the great French Impressionistic painter Claude Monet. And we will be playing this French Impressionistic concert. The Impressionistic movement in music took place primarily in France uh, around the turn of the last century, so around 1900. One thing the Impressionistic composers were very concerned with was what is the emotion that the listener will feel. Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn is perhaps the quintessential impressionistic piece. It starts out with just flute solo by itself, with no accompaniment, and even the notes that Debussy chose for that opening solo are very chromatic, um, meaning uh, it, it doesn't establish a key, it doesn't establish any one note as being more prominent. It just sort of meanders around through, di through different notes. That is emblematic of Impressionism, both in music and in art, where we're not exactly sure what we're looking at or what we're listening to. It sounds very nice, but what exactly is that? With the French Impressionistic painters, similarly, they weren't trying to be very realistic with them. They were, it was more like alluding to an image. The painting behind my back is Boulevard de Capucines uh, by uh, Monet, painted around 1873. And it has all the qualities of this particular movement. And Monet does it with great effects, giving really the impression of a busy street. 
It doesn't define every single top hat. It doesn't define every single uh, gown and, and, and petticoat. And so this was the criticism from the intellectuals that were favoring the academy. They said the critic Louis Leroy, who was the one that gave the term, the derogatory term impressionism, who really criticized this, this black figures. In fact, he called them black tongue lickings. This was un looked unfinished. It looked too sketchy. But this was not the point of the impressionist. They wanted to give the impression, the feeling of that scene in that moment. That has translated into the music in a similar way. You, you get the impression of a certain structure or of a certain harmony, but it's, it's not crystal clear. When nowadays we visit exhibitions, we are seeing paintings that uh, not, were not intended to be shown together in, a, in an exhibition space. And so we are mindful of creating some sort of context we try to allow discreetly ourselves to immerse uh, into a different era that had different perspectives and different experiences. So that will give a glimpse for a visitor into the time, into what have been the Paris that Monet in particular would have known. In Paris at this time, the musicians would read the poems of the poets and they would go to the art exhibits of, of the painters and and vice versa, so they were very much integrated. There's connection between art at the museum, between music at the hall, and in our entire community. We're all connected uh, in many ways, and, and in this case specifically through the arts. That piece did such a fantastic job of showing how disciplines can complement each other for a great experience. And I love that the curator used music to actually help place the paintings. And gallery goers can hear the Denver Philharmonic in the headset of the guided audio tour. You know, Denver is the only city in the country hosting this work by Monet. You can learn more at denverartmuseum.org. And the Denver Philharmonic Orchestra season is in full swing. You can see their schedule online. We're going beyond Impressionism with this next story from our partner station at WOSU in Columbus, Ohio. Neo-Impressionists were artists who responded to Impressionism by bringing back certain painting traditions. Here we pop into the Columbus Museum of Art to learn more about work of avant-garde artists who picked up where the Impressionists left off. Beyond Impressionism is an exciting partnership with the Guggenheim Bilbao, and it has over a hundred works in it. The title is about the fact that this whole show is about that period right after the peak of Impressionism. Impressionism sort of peaks in the 1870s and maybe into the early 1880s. And Impressionism was this breakout moment for modernism. Uh, we think about Monet and Renoir and this whole idea of painting light, literally capturing moments of light. So this was a huge breakthrough. I mean, it changes the arc of what happens in Western painting. But it had sort of a term, it's like, after you've done that, what do you do with it? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you extend that legacy? How do you extend that revolution? Maybe more than legacy. How do you extend that revolution? So that was a challenge for the original Impressionists like Pizarro, Monet, Renoir, but it was also a challenge for the artists coming after them. And so this show is about that real turbulent time of the 1890s, and the Terminus is really sort of the opening of World War I. It kind of goes from the 1890s into the very first decade of the 20th century. Neo-Impressionism is known for this dot thing, the idea of painting with these little dabs and these little dots. It's very much connected to an artist named Seurat. He was part of a group of artists that wanted to sort of get, get a hold of Impressionism, because Impressionism started to get really sort of amorphous. They wanted structure and organization. The other thing you're gonna discover in the exhibition is more about symbolism. Uh, symbolism, the thing to remember about symbolism is it was a way of creating more of a subjective response in painting and graphic art. This is a great period of printmaking and graphic arts. Uh, there's a wonderful artist called Redon. He's very much about the dream, the inner state. It's all subjectivity. 
it's, it's just just the opposite then of Impressionism in that sense. He was very interested in um, uh, not just dreams, but nightmares, and he's interested, he's fascinated by Edgar Allan Poe. He, it almost is like day and night, he goes from these very kind of dark, dark dreams, dark thoughts, and sort of horror kind of lace things to these luminous pictures, which are very like, you know, uh, sort of transform, transformational in the other sense. They, they lift you up. The third thing that you'll discover is this was the period of the birth of celebrity culture and advertising that we now are the heirs of. This was a period filled with these uh, Lagalu, uh, Jane Avril, all these characters, and they would have been as well known to the people of Paris as Beyonce is to us. Neo-Impressionism does grow out of Impressionism, and you can't have any of these pictures without Monet. You can't get to these pictures without going through Monet and Renoir. And so I think they, they are the children of the Impressionist Revolution. So this period, I think, often gets overlooked, but they were fantastic pictures. Up next, the Denver Center for the Performing Arts is busy, to say the least. They produce around nine shows per season. And all of these shows need costumes. Starting with this sketch, a very talented team brings these visions to life. Producer Alexis Kokoen takes us behind the curtain to see how DCPA's costumes go from page to stage. I love telling stories, and I think it's so much fun that I get to come to work every day and play make-believe and dress up, so. <laughs> This is one of nine costume storage rooms that we have here. On this side are women's costumes, the other side are men's costumes. You know, ladies five to five and a half are all in a section and labeled, and men's tens and men's elevens are all right here. Also, this is just our show rack when we're building a show. The actor has a nameplate with their name on it, and the costumes that actor will wear are directly behind the garment bag. I think what's really special about this organization is that it was built on a culture of yes. If the artists can envision it, we can manifest it. When you first start thinking about a show, you're thinking about the design, the visual design of the whole thing, and that's all tied into the core of the story. A Doll's House, the original, that's the one that I'm working on. I wanted it to happen in 1879 when it was written. I wanted it to be photographic. Sometimes we shop things, sometimes we thrift things. Usually for contemporary shows, we tend to kind of shop and thrift, so it looks more authentic. For period pieces, there's not a store that, that sells things for a doll's house, so we're fortunate to have the skills of our costume shop to build more of our period pieces. I will, once I fit this, do a whole bunch of hand stitching to make sure that this all stays in place. When we build a costume from scratch, we work with a team of people. It really does take a village. The process for designing an entire production starts about six to nine months before we even hit the stage. The costumer will bring you renderings, sketches of the costumes. This is the sketch that Megan has done, and this is the skirt, the overskirt for that sketch. And then we talk to a team of drapers who make women's clothes or tailors who make men's clothes. And they kind of figure out how to translate that two-dimensional drawing into a three-dimensional outfit. We do the pattern making, we do all the fitting. We have to figure out how to make an actual garment from the page to an actual person. So they'll do a mock-up, which is basically like a rough draft in an inexpensive cotton fabric called muslin. And we fit that to the actor and make all the changes in the, in the rough draft, essentially. Easy to work with, inexpensive is the key. <laughs> and then we make it out of the real fabric. So it takes a few steps, but that's how we get the great product that we do. It's actually quite comfortable. <laughs> One of the most fun moments in the process is when you actually see the costumes on stage, on the set for the first time, because that's the first time that the whole visual world comes together and it feels like you're actually stepping into the story. I'm sorry, I've, I've just become so bitter. I have to think about myself all the time. I love seeing it happen from page to stage, all my work up there on the stage, helping to tell a story. Yeah, believe me, this is 
This will be the best thing for you. We do keep all of our costumes because they're a huge investment. And it's kind of fun to repurpose garments from another show and give them a new life in a different show five, ten years down the line. There are very few costume departments in the country that can equal what the Denver Center can do. The Denver Center has always been kind of this like beacon of arts and, and things like that and so it's, it really is a dream come true to get to work here and, and be part of this incredible place. Wow, nine storage rooms, yeah. nine. I wish my closets were that big. <laughs> I would love to raid that wardrobe though, seriously. I bet. We'll be on the lookout for more from this series. We'll continue to explore props, wigs, set design. Speaking of which, we're going back behind the curtain for a math lesson. A recent production of Anna Karenina at DCPA required an elliptical deck, which is a specially rounded stage. Carpenters explain the math they use to create this stage. Our content partners at the DCPA take us to their workshop. Anna Karenina in the stage theater, we're laying out an elliptical deck and for purpose of retraining our carpenters, refresher training, we wanted everybody to see several ways to lay out an ellipse in full scale. This is a 19 by 16 foot half ellipse. If I draw a line to a point from one focus and then to the other focus, the combined length of those two lines is the same for any point on the whole thing. I don't want the audience to, to think that it was a mathematical exercise to create what they're seeing on the stage, but the designer had asked for an elliptical deck uh, just in order to initially get that shape. We have to use a little bit of math and some theater trickery to try to lay it out. The eye does actually perceive things that are not true or have small blemishes. But even though this ellipse is very large, if it doesn't continue properly and if it's not symmetrical, the audience will actually notice that. I showed a technique with a tool that we built a few years ago that requires less math and, and it's just a different way to do it. What's nice about that technique for this process, when the scenics go to paint maybe five or six different ellipses, it'll be very quick for them to adjust and draw those lines and, and they'll all be perfectly offset from each other. So loosen this, move it in, and swing it again. Those will never have to change. We took those plywood shapes that we had drawn on in the shop, cut them out, framed each one into a platform. We brought them all to the theater and then our people loaded them in. For the next three days, we'll have scenic crews in here painting. They're measuring out the ellipse just like we did in the paint shop. That's the ellipse tool. And now we're gonna draw the ellipses on top again. So he's laid it out from that side of the stage and he's gonna draw it over to the other side and see where we meet. We've hit our line in about seven eighths of the places. And then on this one side over here, we're off by just about that much and the scenic artists will fudge that. Look at that! They drew the line all the way to here, and this is where we are. So in the paint shop, that's the same line we drew in the plywood that's underneath. when our sister goes behind the scenes. We're really lucky to get these special glimpses into how these incredible productions are made. Yes, yes, yes. And there's more. The DCPA has another video from the Standing Equation Math and Art Series. You can learn all about building pentagons for their five-sided stage in the Space Theater by visiting us at rmpbs.org slash artsdistrict. Up next, a Thornton artist takes to his first outdoor mural, creating a whimsical world with an important message. A storm drain is transformed into a call to action to prevent pollution. Our content partners at the City of Thornton bring us this story. And it's kind of like a meditation uh, to get to paint on concrete sidewalk. Painting, especially in this form, isn't something uh, I get the opportunity to do much of. Mainly I'm a pencil and pen and ink artist. So this year I wanted to do something a little bit more fun, a little more cartoony. Octopus tentacles reaching out through the storm drain and holding a sign. And the sign is going to say, help keep the deep need. <laughs> Art 
has always been used to uh, bring attention to social, political, environmental issues. It feels great. It makes me feel like I, um, I'm doing something right with my artwork. <laughs> or it'd be uh, graffiti. <laughs> Just kind of like leaving a little mark on the city. That specifically is from me. Thanks to Lisa Wilson for producing that story from the city of Thornton. And last on today's program, a performance from the band Stray Grass. Thanks to our partners at 970 West Studio and Mesa County Libraries. Let's check out their soothing stylings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like seven Spanish angels And I would play on my guitar The words I messed up didn't matter I saw a smile in her heart If I could love like my grandma Feels that's what it's for. If I could work like my grandpa, I'd be a better man by far. All the things he tries to teach me, written in the stars. Wow, the Mesa Library is such a cool place to record bands. I really enjoyed that. Look at you. <laughs> well, that's it for our show. Thank you so much for joining us on Arts District. You can check out our Instagram for more on Colorado artists. And a behind-the-scenes look at the making of the show. You can always watch us at rmpbs.org slash artsdistrict. And you can never have too much Monet, so we leave you with more from our time with the Denver Philharmonic Orchestra. I'm Kate Ferdoni. And I'm Michael Gadlin. Until next time. Make it easy. But make it. <laughs>